85% of controlling anybody is what they see on a repetitive basis. The poor masses out there that are kept in the dark about what's going on, who's organizing this, or what the end goals are, if they know none of this, they're just going to go with it with what their neurology pushes them toward, what feels safer. And it was a well-baited trap. What felt safe was shutting your own business. What felt safe was blocking your lungs and your body from getting oxygen. What felt safe was sort of injecting unknown material into your body. Of course it's an ambush, because when you look over that, none of that is safe, zero. Jason Christoph, psychological expert, behavioral expert, helping us to understand how our minds can be programmed for the negative and for the positive, how we can do it to make positive change in our own lives. I want to start by asking you, are we, are we free as individuals in, in the way that we think? Well, we think we're free, and that goes a long way to mind control. There was a CIA expert or a CIA staffer called to a congressional committee in about, I think it was 1962. And they wanted to investigate how far this technology had gone. And the congressional committee asked, <clears throat> what are you able to do with this technology? And the CIA expert smiled at the camera and said, well, given enough time, we can make anybody kill their own parents and eat them in a soup. So there's a lot of weaponized psychology against the public. The average person thinks they're in complete control of their behavior, which goes a very long way to mind controlling someone if they think the, their own behavior is organic to them. But in the realm of psychological manipulation, even the percentages, it's 93 to 97% of your behavior is formulated and manufactured by a part of the brain that is outside our conscious awareness. And it's coming from the behavior we're putting out in the world is coming from programs in that part of the mind called the subconscious. And it's the same thing as sort of like a cut healing. You get a cut, it heals, you don't have a say. You couldn't accelerate it if you wanted to. You couldn't slow it down. The vast majority of our behaviors like this, it's, it's automatic. It's, we're not really in control of it. We think we are in, in regards to be, you know, we're our own behavior. But all the research points that this free will is sort of an illusion. But the stronger someone gets the stronger they can get mentally, intellectually, spiritually, even financially, because a lot of mind control is financial, where if they said you have to do X, Y, and Z, or you can't have your job, like you have to do um, participate in a med medical experiment, or you're, you're going to be unemployed if you don't have a million and a half in the bank, well, you're mind controlled to comply with that sort of uh, request. So it's shown, although the free will is more of a myth, it's also shown that the stronger a person is, if they spiritually know why they're here, they're here for, they're not here to watch Netflix and drink beer. Let's just put it that way. If they're emotionally strong, if they can weather the storm and not bend to group pressure, financially strong, physically strong, where they think, I'm strong enough to whether a storm, a physical battle with the group. And so all these layers of strength has been shown to allow someone to claw back some of that free will a little bit at a time, to take more control of their behavior. So in, the, in this movement, in the freedom movement, this is called doing the good work, is to know who you are, why do you do what you do, and if you have any bad programming, that's being downloaded into you through repetitive content via the media, government policy, or your own parents, are you able to identify it and reprogram yourself so you keep the good stuff your parents gave you and eliminate the bad stuff? So there's ways to claw back your free will. 
I'd love to come back to that point around personal responsibility and take an agency over that uh, to and to what degree we can. But before we go into that, I'd like to know a little bit about the history of this. Obviously, advertisers, marketers have understood some of these tools in order to persuade people to purchase products that yeah. are heavily used within their act of consumption. But how far does this understanding of these types of tools and technologies go back? It goes back very far. So if you go to Google and put in just the country media, it's actually an old country. This is where we get our name media today. So it's an old country, thousands of years old. It's where Iran or Azerbaijan is today. And the occupants of media were called the Medes, and they were notorious for understanding group pressure, human psychology, psychological manipulation, and they were so versed at it. They would gather kings and queens of the Mediterranean, bring them into media, and say, this is how you control your people. Because 85% of controlling anybody is what they see on a repetitive basis. So we all have these safety systems. Cut healing is one of them. It's automatic. We have this other safety system where our subconscious will look out into any environment we're in and count the repetitive content. That repetitive content is counted by the subconscious because it will represent what the bigger herd is saying, thinking, or doing. And human psychology is sinful. Most humans, like other humans who act, talk, and think like they do. So your subconscious identifies what the majority is doing through the repetitive content and then forces you to adopt it as your own in order to fit in and blend in and go along to get along. He who controls the repetitive content controls the human. And this is the basic philosophy that the kings and queens of media would teach to the other ruling group around the Mediterranean. Control the repetitive content that they see and what they hear. And there's no TVs there. There's no movie screens. There's no magazines. They would use announcements at the public square. They would use stage productions. They would use the town crier. And they would control. And there was some... Um, you know, different forms of media where the people would get info. And if you could make it repetitive in one direction or the other, this natural part of our brain would do the rest. And they even noticed, they they just started putting this together. They would have the stage productions before they knew any of this. And if the hero wore a red cape, the merchants in the Agora would say, that's that's so good that you had the, the, the red caped hero. I'm sold out of red tapestry. Sold out. And then, so the next week, they might have the hero, the female hero of a stage production, would be wearing a particular gold necklace. And sure enough, it sold out as well. So you could see that authority-based imprints, repetitive content... Po- like positive emotions that wash over, say, the red cape or the, the gold necklace really leads the be- behavior of the human. So today we just think it was invented by Edward Bernays, but it is not invented by Edward Bernays. It's invented by this very old group that have been doing this to us for a very long time. And if anybody wants to know how old the group is, there's a great documentary that can take people on an A to Z tour of this group. It's called Cult of the Medics. Cult of the Medics by Canadian David Whitehead. There's nine chapters of it. And there's probably no better documentary to show this group that masquerade as our governments have mind controlled us by modifying our repetitive content to make us believe that... Stealing our money is not theft, it's taxes. Getting bullied around or trying to deny the taxation with threat of imprisonment, this is fair. They've manufactured a box for us to live inside. And if you go back to the ancient rituals of this cult, and that's what it is, is it's a cult, you'll find one of their primary symbols is a cube. And it is a cube because it represents the number four, but it means box them in. Give them enough mind control so that they live in the box, breathe in the box, think in a box, and they cannot 
even though this box is sort of made of invisible walls, they can't think their way out of it. And so this is why this is called the Saturnian cube, but it's all about using this mind control technology to trap people in a certain way of thinking so they can't get out. I mean, there's people out there right now that are still wearing face coverings, going for their eighth or ninth uh, application of a medical experiment. They're in this box that's based completely on controlling the repetitive content. And this is why censorship is next the, their next big agenda, because it's not censorship. It's controlling the repetitive content within an inch of their agendas. So there'd be no counter narrative. And it's being shown for, to break someone out of this mind control to actually need a counter narrative. So if they can censor us and dominate our subconscious mind pathways and flood the pathways only with their repetitive content and our subconscious takes care of the rest, we're in a hundred years, we're going to forget we could be farm animals and believe that we were always born to be farm animals, literally. There's so much in here. I'd like to unpack a little bit how some of these techniques were used during the COVID chapter. Well, basically, there's a, a psychiatrist named Eust Merlu, and he wrote a book. You can get it free on the internet. It's called Rape of the Mind and Menticide. And it's just a really honest psychological evaluation of the best way to behavior modify prisoners. And it's cruel, but he recorded everything. He worked with Korean prisoners of war and how to best bend them to. It wasn't him that was doing it. He was just taking the Koreans' data. That was basically the the manual for COVID. One of, one of the applications of behavior modification in Dr. Merlu's book was isolation. You need to get... All animals, if you're going to train all animals, you need them isolated from the others. So there's no counter narrative. Also, humans are pack animals. This is where they get, gather their strength. If you can isolate someone out of the pack, they don't physically, they don't mentally feel as strong. And all mind control is based on like financial weakness, physical weakness, mental weakness. The more I can knock you down, the more you'll comply to my command. So Juice Merlu wrote a lot about put them in isolation. It doesn't matter if it's a dog. That's why they train dogs in isolation. That's why they tra ho train horses in isolation so, you can, so that they ha have the center point of attention and obey your command only. Now, someone like Edward Bernays said that, you know, there's going to be a lot of group pressure. No, group pressure is just, I don't want people to get mixed up with group pressure. Group pressure is just the repetitive content of what's getting fired out of your TV. That registers as group pressure. So what happened, say, during COVID, one facet of it got the people in isolation, eliminated the counter narrative, and then drove a one-sided narrative, one-sided repetitive content, drove it into the stratosphere. It has been shown that you only need two pieces of repetitive content for me to modify your own behavior. So if someone's sitting there in isolation, in fear, fear upregulates it. Group pressure is upregulated if you feel weak. Alcohol makes you weak. This is why the bottle shops were open. This is why all the fast food uh, shops were open. This is why in Canada, the marijuana shops were open. Because they not only wanted you at home, isolated with your family, they wanted you weakened nutritionally. They wanted you drunk. They wanted you smoking marijuana. They wanted you as weak as possible so that the repetitive imprint of the, excuse me, it's a, kind of hot in here, but the repetitive imprint that was coming out of the TV, if you're weak and the group pressure is so high, I mean, the higher the group pressure would only reflect the, great, the greater repetitive content. So they're, they're drowning your subconscious mind pathway with a, a group, and it's fictitious. It's just coming out of news studios. But you feel like it's a thousand to one. It feels like everybody else is masking. Everybody else is six-foot distancing. Everybody else is waiting for the shot. And 
it's been shown that if you're strong, you still might not be able to, re, re, you know, resist that kind of group pressure. But if you're drunk, smoking marijuana, and also eating junk food, there's probably no way you're going to feel strong enough on any level to go against the herd. And that's all part of the mind control manual that Dr. Juice Merlu put together when he was studying the Korean prisoner of wars. So it's, it's very important that the public understand that the psychology, the known psychology was weaponized against the public. The only science that is truly settled is the science of behavior modification and, and mind control. And this was not a misunderstanding of the science. This was not a chance happening. This sort of weaponization of psychology has to be planned to the nth degree. Even in the UK, where Chris Whitty, is that his name? Mm. He would come to the podium and he would have something on his podium and it had that kind of warning tape around the perimeter, a yellow and red sort of warning perimeter around stay home, save lives. In psychology, it's shown that things, if when humans are shown animals that are red or yellow, yellow, like the Asian killer hornets, which are red or yellow, like a wasp, they have greater fear reactions. Like every single level was weaponized against the public. And that's what drove it. This was not based on clinical virology. This was based on behavioral psychology. And the poor masses out there that are kept in the dark about what's going on, who's organizing this, or what the end goals are, if they know none of this, they're just going to go with, the, with what their neurology pushes them toward, what feels safer. And it was a well-baited trap. What felt safe was shutting your own business. What fell safe was blocking your lungs and your body from getting oxygen. What felt safe was sort of injecting unknown material into your body. Of course, it's an ambush because when you look over that, none of that is safe. Zero. So they can bait this psychological trap with something that looks and smells and feels like safety but it's not safety. And that's what happened from 2020 still to this day. It, to me, when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's basic survival. Yeah. <clears throat> the safety element, the manipulation of the idea of safety seemed to be so central to this component. And as you say, it's continuing. Yes. It's a safety culture that we're emerging into. And as a result, people are willing to forego, it seems, all, all manner of things, their freedoms, their rights, their sanity. Right. Not only to conform with the group, but actually to, to get that sense of safety. So... How, how important is that as a driver? It you know, sounds like it's a very deliberate attempt. It is the most basic wiring we have is to be safe. Everything from a woman's menstrual cycle to the cut healing to your skin regenerating, it's all to make you safe. Like every cellular function we have is to make our, ourselves safe. So of course it's, it's something, if you can identify exactly how that works, and turn the knob either a couple inches to the right or a couple inches to the left, and you can manipulate those safety signals, which is what they do. And they're just saying, you know, it's it's not it's, there's no safety in closing your business and destroying your own local economy. Where do you think your food's going to come from? Where do you think your heat's going to come from? Where do you think your hydro is going to come from? And people were complaining, oh my God, the food prices are astronomical. The heat prices, the energy prices in the UK alone were massive. And that's because there used to be a supply chain where everything would flow smoothly. But if you shut down every 10th shop or you disable every 10th person that's working in the supply chain, you only have less supply. And if you got less supply in the same amount of people, the prices skyrocket. So it was, this is a basic manipulation of the foundational programming in every cell in our body, which is our need to be safe, to have people around, to be accepted, 
to feel like we're part of the group. And this is why they, in celebration of one group as opposed to the other, really signifies to our neurological system where we're supposed to go. So everybody that had the Facebook sticker, whatever it's called, the stamp, uh, the, you know, the profile picture maybe, and it says, I did, I, you know, I complied. And they would celebrate it. This is, this is where you're going to get the most accolades. This is where you're going to get the energy. This is where someone pats you on the back as opposed to kicking you in the gut. And kicking you in the gut is not safe. Patting you on the back is very safe. If you walk into a tribal environment and they're laughing and accepting you, you're safe. If you walk into a tribal environment and someone's calling you a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist that just killed my grandma, you're not safe. So they also are very good at rewarding the behavior they want publicly. And then they'll do what's called in psychology, they'll shoot a hostage. So they'll come up with a doctor who actually did the moral thing, did the right thing, put money in fr- uh, put morality in front of money, and saved lives. That guy's the bad guy. So they'll take one guy up knowing that there's a thousand doctors doing the same, five thousand thinking of doing the same. They hold up that one doctor, boom, shoot the hostage. Now all the doctors are like, that's not safe. So again, it's a complete manipulation of our basic safety protocols in our, in our cellular DNA. And you have to be a real man or a real woman, know what you're here for, in order to override that and say, yeah, they're going to call me this. I might lose my job, but I'm here to do the right thing and not the easy thing. And there used to be a lot of people like that. And pre-COVID, for four or five decades before COVID, they made people weak. They made them weak purposely so that when they did shoot the hostage, they had greater impact. Because if you tried this 50 years ago, people would be saying, no, USA, individual rights over collective rights. No, I'm not taking it. I don't care what you do. But they've eroded the strength, like I said, Mind control, susceptibility is based on weakness. And over the past 50 years, they've weakened us morally, ethically, physically, financially. 50% of Americans actually live check to check, where if they had a, a great financial impact, potentially had to redo some of their teeth for $1,000, they, they couldn't cover it. That wasn't the case 50 years ago. So not only was COVID launched at us, there was mind control over the past 50 years to put us in a position where we're so weak, they know we're going to comply even with the most irrational and illogical dictates through the bullying force. And you also notice that government officials were talking very aggressively, like uh, Justin Trudeau. You're not going to go on a plane. You're not going to go on a train. You're not going to risk the life of a vaccinated person, that's for sure. And that's being proven in psychology to heighten the aggression of the aggressor. No one's chastising him. So you put a psychological glow on him that it's legitimate. So there's so much at play in the poor public. This is why I talk about it as much as I do, because if they don't know how this works and say disease X comes or something else is coming they won't, they'll be just as defenseless and they're going to walk off the cliff just like they did in 2020. And it it breaks my heart. It breaks many people's hearts. And this is why we do what is right and we forget about what is easy. It's not easy coming, uh, doing things and talking out and putting myself in the line of fire, but I have the five pillars of strength and uh, not many people can get through that on a threat level. Yeah, well, those five pillars of strength, let's hear about that because I can almost hear the audience's question, which is, well, what can we do about it? You know, right. So how, how do we take control? How do we take agency? Easy. Don't go out and find Justin Trudeau. Do not go out and find Klaus Schwab. This is not what's going to do it. Look at your house. Look at your habits and understand that the change that you need to make to resist the next PSYOP 
will come from your internal strength stores, the strength of those five pillars. Look at your cupboards. That's a test your doctor will never run down at the clinic. He never looks at your your cupboards. He never looks at your inside your fridge. It's obvious what the problem is. The average person, again, doesn't know how mind control works. Not only can you get someone to wait in line at a clinic to take in a medical experiment, you can get them eating junk food. You can eat them drinking copious amounts of alcohol. You can get them sitting on the couch and rooting in and wasting their life. You could get them not going to the gym. You can do anything to make them weak. You just have to put the right repetitive content in and the subconscious does the rest. So if you're looking for a solution, the solution starts with your physical pillar. Your physical pillar of strength is the foundational pillar for the other four. And there's one book, you can get it. This guy doesn't even know me. I don't, you know, I don't even know if he likes me. <laughs> He's never thanked me. I pop him all the time. He's never <laughs> congratulated me. And I took courses at his institute. His name is Paul Check, C-H-E-K. And he has one book called How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. That's all you need. Read the book, implement it, and you will see your physical pillar come up. Now we can start putting the other ones financial, right? Do you have enough money to make, make it by any storm or maybe the next storm? Do, are you emotionally sound? Do you feel strong enough mentally to resist, and, you know, resist the next pressure-packed situation? Intellectual strength. Do you, you know, do you know enough about what's going on? Or are you just getting all these downloads from the TV? And I don't know if I mentioned the spiritual strength aspect. Do you know why you're here? I mean, most people today with pornography, self-gratification, uh, sort of taking more than they give. We have children. They take. They're takers. We accept that because they're kids. But there's a point where you have to make a proper rite of passage from child to adult, and you go from taker to provider of the tribe. You're a giver to the tribe. You don't suck energy like an energy vampire out of the tribe. You provide resources. You provide strength. You provide leadership. This is what the spiritual aspect is. You're here as a male. It's a different spiritual aspect than a female. As a male, I'm here to be the strongest version of myself because my cosmic role is to protect the female. Not the females, the female energy on this planet. Protect the children from evil. And evil is live spelled backwards if you don't know what that means. Anything that jeopardizes life or living is evil by definition. Protect the seniors because they can't defend themselves and protect the disabled. That's my job as a male. And with the five pillars, I can execute that charge. And if all males in the tribe are built their five pillars individually, not based on someone pushing them around, but because it's intrinsic to them, they know their code, then this thing is over immediately. And so the this answer to all these problems, it doesn't matter if it's eating bugs or whatever, whatever, you know, Project Blue Beam or whatever nonsense is coming down the pipe. So they'll throw everything at us. But if you're strong, male and female, have your own different ways of accomplishing the five pillars, it doesn't matter because you're not going to fall for it or we're not going to fall for it and as a greater quantity. And that's a victory and that's what we got to go for. Jason, the thing I want to close with because from what I understand, you know, our brain is subconsciously processing this information all the time. If we take those five pillars and we bring make ourselves strong physically, mentally, emotionally, mm -hmm. financially, et cetera, spiritually, then we increase our chances of being resistant to that. But yeah. what was interesting in one of your talks, you spoke about how magic is neither light or dark. It's in the heart and intention of the magician. So in which case, can we also use some of these techniques ourselves to positively program our subconscious so that we're actually taking agency of that side of things? Can we Can we reprogram our own behaviors so that we take agency of the programming of our minds on the same basis. Absolutely. There's only one way to mind control a person is to control the repetitive content. That's 85%. Everything after that's fine tuning. So for me, I know that. 
So I'm not going to watch TV. I know there's a big hall there for people out there. I don't own a TV. I don't watch TV because there's nothing repetitive on that's going to make my life better. So for me, I'll give myself repetitive content, but only in the five pillar areas. Something that makes my financial strength go up. Something that makes my physical strength go up. And then my subconscious does what it does. It says, hey, Jason's in a very powerful tribe. If he's, if he's not powerful, he's in jeopardy. He's not safe. So my subconscious starts leading the way invisibly to, be, to accomplish this for me, on my behalf, outside my conscious awareness, to compete and be the best person I can be. And so I control the pictures in my house. I control the audio podcasts or documentaries that I see and hear. I control what goes in my eyes. I control what thoughts go through my head. I don't, if I make a mistake, I'll be honest with you. There's, I've been in business for 20 years. Um, the businesses I own or have partnered in have made $250 million. Now, there's no way, I don't have anywhere close to that uh, between the tax man and expenses, nowhere close. But I'll tell you, somewhere along the line last year, I lost about $200,000 in a very short amount of time. I still didn't beat myself up because that's my program. I looked at it as a positive. I looked at it as a learning experience. I didn't shame myself. I didn't guilt myself because I know they, they weaponize guilt to put people under easier forms of mind control. They weaponize shame. They weaponize feeling down. And th they say a mistake is something that should get you an F and you should be ashamed. But mistakes are experiences. They show you what won't work next time. Helps you dip, narrow down what will work. So just tell these, anybody wants to basically control their environment, control the repetitive content of their environment to things that you want to accomplish. Like if you want better relationships, upregulate the content and better relationship patterns or like audios or videos or documentaries. But if you want to be rich, go, go Anthony Robbins, Frank Car uh, Cardone, or whatever you want to do, focus on your goal and then upregulate and turn everything else off. Downregulate everything else, upregulate what's there, like what you want to accomplish, and you will, you will accomplish it. You'll find your, your body's a magic machine. Trust me, you'll get there. This has been a fascinating conversation. Thanks so much. I know people at home want to find out how they can find more of your material. You know, you're always bombarded with people around you after talks at seminars. Um, how can people find out more about your work and stay connected? Easy. Just get on. I, I teach it for free. I want to teach it for free. I can't win this fight on my own. I need some other strong people next to me. So email info at jchristoff.com, single initial J. Christoph is Christ with an OFF on the end. Info at jchristoff.com. I'll put you on my email list. I'll just teach you like slow drip the information to you for free over time so you don't uh, so you don't choke on it you can make the changes easily in your life incredible thanks so much and thanks for being here with us oh, always a pleasure Welcome to Free Humanity. I'm inviting you to join us on the Road to Geneva, our exciting new campaign to resist the World Health Organization. The Road to Geneva campaign will culminate in a pan-European convoy that's going to converge outside the city of Geneva on Friday, the 31st of May, ahead of a peaceful rally outside the United Nations building on Saturday, the 1st of June. If you want to join us, head over to roadtogeneva.com. You'll find out about our latest convoy plans and the wider campaign to challenge the who, and I hope we'll see you on the road to Geneva.